صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت طيبين الطاهرين سيما الحجة بقية الله الأعظم روحي وأرواحنا له فداء ولعن الدائم على أعدائهم إجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري وأسر لي أمري وحل الأغدة من لساني يفقه قولي So yesterday we talked a bit about hardships and how we should perceive hardships as individuals and we said that hardships is a universal law. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be a part of this material world and you can't change it. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be part of this material world and you can't change it. But is it without wisdom? We mentioned four wisdoms behind hardships and why hardship is an essential part of this life. The first one was that conflict is the law of progress. If you want to see any development, it is conditioned by some sort of a hardship. The second that we mentioned was to separate the evil from the good, sometimes in the society to separate the believers from the hypocrites. Sometimes, no, it's within the heart of a believer. He carry around some spiritual diseases which, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants to erase from his heart. How does he do it? Through hardships. The third one was awakening and motion. In other words, sometimes a wake-up call, hardships can be a wake-up call for a lot of individuals. They see some hardships in their life, therefore they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after facing hardships in their life. And we've seen this in many cases, people that have had these near-death experiences where they turn to the Lord afterwards. And the fourth and last one was hardships makes, makes us grateful as individuals. mentioned in the Holy Quran. So we become humble individuals. So we become grateful individuals. And that's a simple fact. There's a logic behind it. Just imagine who can enjoy the pleasure of being a person, for example, that wants some rest, for example. Who enjoy resting, for example? The person that walked a lot or the person who'll be sitting in his couch all day? There's no doubt about that, that the person who'll be walking all day, been striving all day, the, the enjoyment he gets out of the rest when he comes home and the gratefulness that he has when he rests at night is much different than the person that is sitting all day. It's not the same enjoyment that they get out of it. The same action, there's no difference between the action. So all sorts of enjoyment, all sorts of pleasure, all sorts of ease and comfort are always accompanied with some sort of hardship and difficulties and tribulations in life. We can't change it. But I mentioned a point as well that I want to emphasize today. And that's how we perceive hardship. Because sometimes you see amongst our youth, when they face some hardships in life, they start believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cursed them. There's some sort of curse in their life. I'm sitting in an office in the masjid. People will be calling me, Sheikh, I have some problems in my marriage. Can you help me find out if somebody did sihr on, on me, for example? Black magic. That's the first solution that they turn to. They say the cause is black magic. As the first thing, they think it's some sort of a curse from, from people around them. Why do you perceive hardships as being a curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The other way around, sometimes blessings, we look at people with wealth, for example. We look, oh, he's non-Muslim. He's the most corrupt individual. But look how blessed he is. He has so many things in life. He has a car, he has a nice house, he has an education, he has a title. He's famous. And we start to believe that all these things is a blessing for that individual. But the true perspective and the truth behind blessings and somebody being cursed goes back to how you what you do with these blessings that you are being blessed with let me give you an example Fir'aun he's famous mentioned in the Holy Quran as being a person with authority but did his title his power his authority money his government his army benefit him was it a blessing for Fir'aun or was it a curse because he used it for the wrong purposes, for a corrupt purpose? There's no doubt about it. 
And then you see a person, he uses his sickness, which is a hardship, to see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That sickness becomes a blessing for that individual, like Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam. Blessings and adversities, tragedies, it depends on what you use it for. A person, he can be poor, but use that poverty to see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, a person, he can have everything in life and use it for a corrupt person. And vice versa, a person he can have everything but sacrifice it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a person can be poor and ungrateful. It all goes back to how you use the blessings that you are blessed with and not the blessing itself. Yes, it's a blessing from the message, for the person who sent it. But for the receiver, it depends on how you use it. How you use your fame, your money, your wealth, your health. That defines whether it's a blessing for you or if it's a curse. That defines whether you're going to be like Fir'aun or you're going to be like Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam. Or if you're going to be like Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. It's not like you only have to be poor as a Muslim. No, you can own half of the world and use it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is narrated that Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam in the night time, he would put his arms around his neck on the prayer mat and tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I haven't forgot who I'm from. I'm still your slave. This is how he treated authority, power, fame. He used it for the right purpose. Therefore, he became Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salatu So adversities, tragedies, hardships, you des- decide whether you're going to be a blessing or a curse. It's up to you to decide it. The same goes for problems in marriages, family issues, family-related issues, issues in organizations, for example. It's all trials. It's hardships, true, but you decide whether it's going to be a curse for that community or for that individual or it's going to be a blessing for you. You decide it. So it's up to you. That's why you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He said, وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُزَهُمْ يَدْلِمُونَ Through these hardships, we didn't oppress these people. They oppressed themselves. In other words, they didn't use the hardships to seek closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They used the hardships to become ungrateful individuals. Take all the blessings we actually gave them for granted. They were the one oppressing themselves. We didn't oppress anyone because we showed them the way. It was up to them. They decided whether it's going to be one another. That's why you see a person, he came to Prophet Shu'ayb alayhi salatu wasalam. Prophet Shu'ayb. And he said, how come, this? look how smart he think he was. How come that I've committed so many sins and I still commit sins? He's talking to the Prophet of his time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not putting me through any hardships. This person, he was th- thinking to himself, assuming that the lack of hardships in his life is equal to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not cursing him. He's not a cursed individual. He said, I keep sinning, nothing happens to me. No hardships, no trials, no tribulation. Prophet Shu'ayb alayhi salam, he gave him the answer. He said, you have been subjected to the worst kind of punishment without you even knowing it. Without you even knowing it. The Prophet ﷺ, he explains in a hadith what this kind of punishment is. He said, there's no punishment more severe than hard-heartedness. Or ashaddu qaswa, as we mentioned in the Holy Quran. This person, his heart was like a stone. He thought the lack of hardship in his life was that he was blessed, even though that he kept committing sins. Prophet Shu'ib salam, he told me, no, it's opposite. You're a cursed individual. You're being left to yourself. That's even worse. That's even worse than accepting hardships and seeing some self-development in your life, seeing some progress in your life. Why? Because all sorts of progress have been stopped. The same moment you became arrogant with your sins, instead of repenting and turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you thought the lack of hardships in your life was something positive? No. It's a curse for you as an individual. That's why you see Imam Khomeini rahmatullah sometime every 30 days, 40 days, if not, something bad didn't happen in his life, he would cry in his night prayer to an extent that his khadim used to come to him and ask him. He, he said that it's an interview with the khadim, you can find it, with the servant of Imam Khomeini rahmatullah when he was in France. He said, I saw Imam in the night time, in his night prayer, Salatul Layl. Cry and cry and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have you left me for myself? Have you left me alone since you're not testing me or putting me through hardships anymore? This is the perception that these individuals had. Because they saw hardships as a 
opportunity to, for self-development. For self-development. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear. Yeah? We're not oppressing these individuals through hardships. No, it depends on themselves. Inna hadayna hu sabil, imma shakira wa imma kafura. It depends on themselves. Whether they're going to be grateful or they're going to disbelieve. We show them the way. We show them that hardships is the law of progress. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be a part of your life. You can't separate it from this worldly life. So let's move on to the next discussion or the next subject, which is very important that we discuss. So we talked a bit about hardships, but what kind of hardships is it that we should accept, Sheikh? Yeah? Because sometimes we think that it's all sorts of hardship. We should just lay back and suffer for the rest of our life. There will be no comfort, no ease, no nothing. Every hardship is a good hardship that we can use as a part of our self-development. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. There's two different types of hardships and they're different. different Essentially, they're different. Why? Because one of them is a pos positive form of hardship that actually can be a part of your self-development. The other one, no. It's just the consequences of you doing something stupid, in other words. And that's not hardships that is going to make you develop. So what's the first one? Self-inflicted ob obstacles in your life. In other words, self-inflicted hardships. That's the first category. Hardships we create for ourselves. We're going to explain a bit about it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions this type of hardships in the Qur'an a lot. The second one is hardships we face in our journey towards perfection. And that's a, per that's a good type of hardships we should accept. How should we accept it? We're going to talk about it, inshallah. But let's return to the Holy Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about hardships that are self-inflicted. The best example He gives throughout the whole Qur'an is the example of Bani Israel. Bani Israel. He explains in a verse There were two individuals from Bani Israel They were God-fearing persons They were pious people So they told the others from Bani Israel Sorry, that's the verse So Prophet Musa السلام, with Bani Israel they were given the order to enter a city. To enter a city, but two of these individuals, they told the rest of the Bani Israel, let's enter from the gate. Because you're going to be victorious over the people that are living in that city if you enter from the gate. The rest of Bani Israel, they turned around and they told Prophet Musa السلام, the following. They said, قَالُوا يَا مُوسَى O Musa, إِنَّ لَن نَدْخُلُهَا أَبَدًا مَا دَامُوا فِيهَا We're never going to enter the city as long as individuals, these individuals that we're going to fight, they're inside the city. We're never going to enter that city. In other words, we don't, we don't want to fight. We're just going to sit back and look how they talk to their own Prophet afterwards. فَذْهَبْ أَنْتَ وَرَبُّكَ فَقَاتِلَ إِنَّهَا هُنَا قَائِدُونَ You and your Lord, you go fight, do all the hard work, accept all the hardships. When you're finished, we're just going to sit here and we're going to enter the city as being victorious. Like some of us are waiting for the 12th Imam, that the others do the fighting, right? And then afterwards we come and the Imam he brings comfort to our lives. That's how they talk to Prophet Musa a.s. Look how Prophet Musa a.s. he answers Bani Israel. He said, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لَا أَمْلِكُ إِلَّا نَفْسِي وَأَخِي He turns towards his Lord, he said, I don't have anybody but myself and my brother Harun alayhi salam. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He punished Bani Israel afterwards. In other words, look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is subjecting Bani Israel to self-inflicted hardships, in other words. Because if they want to lay back and be lazy in this instance, when it's demanded for them to strive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they didn't do it, look what happened to them afterwards. What kind of hardships they should be going through now. قَالَ فَإِنَّهَا مُحَمَّمَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةٌ No problem. You don't want to accept the hardships that are related to fighting these individuals? That's fine. Now you can wander around in the desert for 40 years. Let's see what kind of hardship or worse. Self-inflicted obstacles and hardships. So now when they're walking around in the desert for 40 years, you think that's going to be a, a part of their self-development as individuals? Of course not. It was a consequence of their own laziness because they didn't want to fight when it was demanded from them. They didn't want to strive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it was demanded from them. 
فَإِنَّهَا مُحَرَّمَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةٌ Now you walk around in the desert for 40 years as a consequence. That's a self-inflicted object. But dear brothers and sisters, this is not only related to what? Bani Israel. Don't think it's only Bani Israel that can be subjected to self-inflicted objects. Uh, hardships. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains in the Holy Quran, أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْدِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْدِ Do you believe in some of the scripture? And have disbelief in other parts of the scripture? Look at the, the next part, how he explains. In other words, are you cherry picking when it comes to the scripture? You want to pick whatever you like from Islam? And there are certain aspects of it, you just leave it? You want to pray and feel spiritual? But when you have to work with other believers and it's hard for you because it goes against your own nafs, you don't want to do it, you want to be lazy? Then he explains. فَمَا جَزَاءُ مَنْ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا The consequences of that is what? The reward for acting in such way is nothing but disgrace in this worldly life. He's not talking about the hereafter, the punishment. He's talking about this worldly life. He promised you there will be some sort of a disgrace for you. And how many times doesn't it happen for ourselves? We commit a sin, for example, we have to face the consequences of it. That's how it is. Sometimes we don't understand the consequences of our own actions, our sins. You see a person, he has an unlawful income. Ten years down the road, he has to face a disease. He's being tested with his wife, with his family members, his children sometimes. His parents, for example. That's self-inflicted hardships that's not going to help you develop. That's self-inflicted hardships that we should prevent. We shouldn't be like, oh, alhamdulillah, now everything is good. I've been sinning and this is the consequences of it. Now I'm seeking towards my Lord. No. This is only the consequence to clear out the actions you were doing. To clear out the mess that you created. There's nothing else than that. You're just cleaning up your own mess. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have promised us this. In another verse, sometimes it's not only the existence of something. In other words, we do corrupt actions or we sin or something like that. No, sometimes it's the lack of something that actually creates hardships in our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in the Holy Quran. فَمَنْ عَرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ذَنْكَ A person who keeps away from our remembrance, who turns away from our remembrance, he will have a miserable life. In other words, if you don't remember the greater purpose in life, you will have a miserable life. And don't come back afterwards and be like, oh, my life is so difficult, I have mental issues and this and that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised you, if you forget about the greater purpose in life, this world is going to take you with you. They're going to fool you, just like Amir al-Mu'mineen have told us in numerous narrations. If Nahj al is famous for one thing, it's that Amir al-Mu'mineen he talks bad about dunya all the time. This worldly life. Because if you don't remember the greater purpose, your life will be miserable. And that's a universal law as well. And sometimes these mental hardships are even more difficult than the physical ones. Once, there were one of my teachers, he told me that he was in Ziyarah, he was in Mashhad, next to the Dari of Imam Rida salam. So he saw a person who was next to the dhari, crying and crying and crying. So he was like, I want, to, I want to find out what is it that he's crying so much about. Because he was really crying and it was not like in a normal type of, you know, shedding tears like we see normal people do when they do ziyara. So he was like, maybe I can help him, maybe there's some issues in his life. So he went close and he was listening to what he was saying. And then he was like, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, bihaq rida, bihaq Imam Rida alayhi salam. How come you gave my neighbor this car, you gave, you gave him this kind of house, he got these children, I didn't get the same, right? SubhanAllah, this person came to Imam Rida to talk about his own jealousy with Imam Rida He's a prisoner and a slave of his own mind, this individual, of his own jealousy. He couldn't control it. Self-inflicted hardships. Sometimes it's jealousy, it's arrogance, and it creates some mental hardships for individuals that are even worse than physical hardships. Trust me, having to deal with jealousy, with arrogance and these spiritual diseases is much worse than physical harm. A person, trust me, he'd rather be slapped in the face than carry around arrogance in his heart. I'm 100% sure of that. 
Because the hardships that he has to go through now, the mental hardships, it's going to be much worse than the physical hardships you face when, that, when you're tested, when some physical hardships in your life. So what kind of hardship should we embrace? So that was the first category. What kind of hardship was that? Self-inflicted hardships. We should make sure that self-inflicted, we minimize self-inflicted hardships in life. How do we do that? First and foremost, stay away from what is haram, simply. Like this is quite simple, but sometimes it's more difficult than just saying it, right? And do what is wajib upon us. Try to have some sort of a dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a daily basis. Start slowly, but make sure it's there. Make sure it's something that is being done on a daily basis. When it, whether it's the taqibat, when it's the tasbih, for example, you do istighfar 70 times a day. No matter what it is, just make sure that it's continuous. That's it. Just make sure that it's continuous. That's how you deal with self-inflicted obstacles and hardships. Yeah? So what is the kind of hardships that we should embrace and we should use as a form of self-development? As a part of our own self-development. That's the hardships that we face in our journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, when you do your duty, whether it's waking up for, fajr, for morning prayer, for Salatul Layl, for example. When you have to speak the truth in a society, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult. Why are they going to talk against you? Trust me, take it from a person who's been bashed in the media a lot in Denmark. <laughs> yeah? Sometimes it's difficult. They talk at you, they talk at your family. Yeah? They scratch your car, they smash your car, they send you pictures of your, your house, of your window. They send threats. Sometimes they do even things. I don't even want to mention it here. We received letters in the masjid, we were sitting in the masjid, we see the letter. So the letter was lying on my desk and I told the brother, this letter smells a lot, take it away from my desk, what are you doing? Now the Bilal, some person, some sick individual, he done something to the pages of the Quran and put it in a letter and left it on the, put it in our mailbox. They do these kind of things when you talk out. Of course, you can be quiet, no issues, no, there will be no issues. But then you're going to face some hardships that are even, even going to be worse in the future. No doubt about that. Have no doubt about that. So these kind of hardships is hardships that we should accept. Why? Because we're doing our, our duty as Muslims. That's why I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He explains in the Holy Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لِنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُونَنَا If you strive on our path, we're going to show you the way. But if you strive, to strive is connected, is related to hardships. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He always talks, when He says jihad, is to strive, that's how simple it is. It's connected to some sort of hardships and we can't change that. So we should embrace it as a part of our what? Self-development and as, as individuals. In another verse from the Holy Quran, فَضَلَ اللَّهُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have preferred the people that strive with their lives and wealth. عَلَى الْقَائِدِينَ الدَّرَجَةً of those who sit back but have an excuse. The verse is about people that sit back with an excuse. Not the individuals like Bani Israel that were sitting back because they were lazy. وَكُلَّ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised nothing but good for these individuals. The people that strive with the money of Allah. It's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult, no doubt about it. But the hardships that are related to doing your duty as a Muslim and seeking towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't be compared to the hardship you're going to face if you don't do it. And that's a natural consequence of you not doing your duty. That's how simple it is. I could mention so many examples. Just take Palestine as an example. If Muslims did their duty, would the people in Palestine, the oppressed people in Palestine face these, these kind of oppressions that we see every day? Of course not. Because, but because people are not willing to strive with their lives and wealth, look what happens then. Then some poor people in Gaza, they have to face the consequences. Some poor people in Yemen, they have to face the consequences. Iraq, Yemen, Sham, whatever you mention it. All as a consequence of what? Muslims not doing their duty. Or else they wouldn't dare to do these things. Or else they wouldn't dare to oppress these individuals. It all goes back to what? People not doing their duty. So that's the natural consequence if you don't strive. Therefore, we should accept these kind, this kind of hardship. So what is the recipe for tranquility when we want to accept these hardships? Because it's going to be difficult, so we need some sort of tranquility. We need some ease in our hearts. Yeah? 
um, comfort in our hearts. Even though that you're in the eye of the hurricane, as they say in English, you want some comfort so you can do your duty towards and work towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to mention three things that our, asati, our, our teachers within akhlaq have mentioned when it comes to having tranquility, when you want to do your duty for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three aspects in life that we should work on. So when we face hardships in our path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't, we don't start doubting whether we're doing the right thing or not. We're not doubting whether we're doing the right thing. The first one, that you're satisfied with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have decided for you. In other words, you satisfied with the result. Sometimes you strive a lot, but we, you shouldn't be only focused on the result. You should be focused on doing your duty. If you see the result is not paying off or it's not as you expect it, be satisfied with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have determined for you. Be satisfied with that. That's the first thing. As-sabru ala ibtila'illah. Have patience when you're being tested. And being patient is not being passive. Don't misunderstand here. It's not being passive. No, it's being active and accepting the hardships that you are facing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they think that being patient is just to throw your head down and walk away. Turn the other cheek. No, that's not how it is. In Islam, we don't have such a patient. To have patience in Islam means that you actively do your duty, but at the same time you accept the hardships that comes your way. That's being patient in Islam. Not some sort of passive type of patience. We don't have that in Islam. as shukra ala ni'amillah. That you're grateful with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have blessed you with. Even if it's something small and something that doesn't have a value in accordance to people that dis disbelievers. Always be grateful. So the first one, you accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determined for you. al rida al-sabr, wa shukr These three th things you can find in Usul al-Kafi, the second, the second uh, book of Usul al-Kafi, where the, the narrations we have about akhlaq, akhlaqiyat, spiritual matters, or ethic, you can find a lot of narrations from Ahlul Bayt salam, and it's recommended that you actually read that part of it. The rest of it, when it comes to doing Simban and stuff, leave that to the ulama, we're not in that stage, but these narrations, it's good for us to actually read them. Then we understand why Sayyidah Zainab alayha, was able, even though she, that she faced all these hardships and tribulations, she was still able to see the beauty in all the tribulations and hardships. That's because of that. Because she was satisfied with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determined for her. She had patience, even though that she faced hardships. And at the same time, and at the same time, she was grateful for, with all the hardships that she faced. She was grateful. Why? Because she knew that these hardships is not a curse, it's a blessing for these individuals. Shahada for Imam Hussein alayhi salam is a blessing. For his enemies, it's a curse. It goes back to how you define it, what you do with it. Yeah? But When you see that a person, for example, when we see children being, being hit, for example, once I was walking on the street and I saw this parent and she was very brutal when it came to her own child. She was pulling him, you know, and then she slapped him. And I, a person who is a parent understand, your heart just, like, my heart was in my throat. I couldn't take it. And I was like, please don't do that. And she was like, no, you don't interfere with my child. And so she stopped because she was embarrassed. But one thing is for sure, dear brothers and sisters, when the children of Abu Abdullah they were walking from Karbala to Sham, there were no individuals telling these individuals not to slap the children of Abu Abdullah. It is narrated that when Sayyidah Ruqayya sallamullah was walking towards Sham with the caravan and Bani Hashim that the daughter according to some narrations the daughter of Shimon according to some narrations the daughter of Hanmala she came she pulled out the earrings from her ears little three year old Ruqayya turned around to the head of Abu Abdullah which was on a spear and she said why is it that these individuals are so brutal 
Don't they know I'm your daughter? If they just asked me, I would have given to them myself. There was no need for them to rip out the, the earrings from my ears. It's, it is narrated every time the children would fall behind, this Mal'un would walk forward and start slapping and hitting the children and the women of Bani Hashem. So the Sadat in the audience, please forgive me for saying this. Sayyidu Raqayya Salamu Alayhi was complaining to her father's head on his spear, saying, every time I fall behind, I wish they left me behind, because every time I fall behind, I see them hit Sayyidu Zainab Salamu Alayhi. But that's nothing compared to what actually happened in Karbala. Abu Abdullah Alayhi Salam, he fell down in the sand. He was lying in the sand. And this Mal'un, he walked forward. He sat on the chest of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, Sayyidina Zainab salamun alayha, she sees him from a long distance. She starts shouting, but nobody's listening, they're shouting. She said, step off, take off your shoes, do you know who you're sitting on? Sayyidina Zainab salamun alayha, start running towards Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, who was lying in the sand. But unfortunately, when she reached Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, it was too late. They were throwing head to head around of Abu Abdullah wasalam. Look at the hardships this woman she went through. Seeing the head of a brother, the imam of her time being thrown around, after seeing her father becoming a martyr, her brother becoming a martyr, her mother becoming a martyr in a young age. Now she has to face what happened there. So she said, leave him alone. And then you had Harmala on one side start hitting the children. You have Sinan on the other side, keep slapping the body of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam that were lying in the sand. Ala la'natullah ala qawm al-zalimeen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.